Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. Well, I got to tell you, um, I, this is the second time trying to tape this because I was starting to read Jude. Can you believe we're up to Jude? And Holy Spirit came, oh, just stirred me. And I, I, I had to literally step out and just go worship the Lord. And so it's been about an hour since then. So we're going to start this again. This is an amazing book, Jude. And we're winding up the reading of the New Testament with Jude because I already did the Bible study on Revelation. This is actually a Bible study. And then probably around Monday, we'll start on Exodus, because we're also going to be starting Bereshit, Genesis, as a Bible study. So by that time, we will have done, we'll have read the New Testament together and also have done a Bible study on Jude, on Revelation, and we'll be beginning a Bible study on Genesis. Just as Luke begins Christian history with the Acts of the Apostles, Jude is chosen to write the next to the last book of the New Testament, which has been appropriately called by many biblical scholars, the Acts of the Apostates, not the Acts of the Apostles, like Luke says on Acts, but the Acts of the Apostates. And I agree with that. Jude would have preferred to write about the common Christian faith shared with his readers but false teachings were becoming so prevalent that he was constrained to pen a plea to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And I want to give a shout out to four of my faves. Many This whole channel family is but who contend for the faith. Chelsea Bedell did an amazing video um, I think her best to date. And I put that on my community wall. Brother Greg Jackson contends for the faith. Sister Lisa Boyce and Brother Barry Scarborough, as do many others. But a big shout out to them. I love them. I'm close to them. And they have been a blessing to me personally. So I just want them to know how much I love them and what a blessing they are. Jude does not mince words. He pulls out all the stops, as it were, to unmask these notorious heretics, drawing illustrations from nature, the Old Testament, and Jewish tradition, Enoch, to stir up the faithful. In spite of its harsh language, the epistle is a masterpiece of construction, studded with triads. An example would be the three evils mentioned in verse 11. The descriptions of the apostles and vivid are, are vivid and unforgettable. The church is forever in debt to Jude for the beautiful benediction which, with which he ends his letter. His epistle may be short, but it is greatly needed in these days of ever-increasing apostasy. Now, as to the authorship, there are three potential Judes that scholars name. I'm going to give you them in one, two, and three, but three is the one that I firmly believe, and I think most, I'm going to say most Judeo-Christian scholars would agree. By saying that, I mean, you know, there are Messianic, that means of Jewish descent, who are believers in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah, and his finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, as am I. So, Jude, same name as Judas and Judah, and the Hebrew would be Yehuda, um, was a very popular Jewish name. Of the seven Judes or Judases in the New Testament, three have been suggested as Jude, and so I'm going to go through. The Apostle Judas, not Iscariot, who had committed suicide, since verse 17 apparently differentiates the writer from the apostles, and since it would strengthen his position if he could claim apostleship, he is an unlikely candidate. Judas, a leader sent to Antioch with Paul, Barnabas, and Silas, 
uh, references Acts 15.22. This is a possibility, but no evident, evidence links this man with the letter. I do, I do not believe it's him. Now, I do believe Judas, Jude, a younger half-brother of our Lord and a brother of James, see the introduction to James as a reference, he is the strongest candidate sharing with the Lord Jesus and with James in his use of nature, illustrations, and a trenchant, colorful style. That's who we accept. That's as the author of Jude. Of course, God breathed, Holy Spirit led. Like his brother James, Jude was too modest to exploit his natural relationship to the Savior. After all, it is a spiritual relationship to the Lord Jesus that counts. Did Christ not say, Whosoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother? That's Matthew twelve fifty. On another occasion, he taught that it was more blessed to hear the word of God and do it than to be a close blood relative of his. That's Luke 11, 28 and 20, Luke 11, 27 and 28. Like James, Jude took the place of a bondservant since both brothers disbelieved in their divine half-brother until after the resurrection. This was a suitable spirit to show. Jude was married and took his wife around on his itinerant preaching tours. Reference 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Jude's grandsons were brought before Emperor Domitian in the 90s on the charge of being Christians, seeing their ha hands harding from years of farming, the emperor released them as harmless Jews. The date. <coughs> Excuse me. Some debate on this. Whether Peter used Jude or Jude adapted to 2 Peter, or both used a common source, is debated. The similarities between the two are too great to be coincidental. Since Peter writes in his second epistle, 2 Peter 2 1 and 3 3, that there will be false teachers and scoffers, and Jude says such men have crept in, in verse 4, it is probable that Jude is the latter writer. A date between 67 and 80 is likely, since Jude makes no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem, AD 70. Um, so we're going to, there are some who believe it may be later, but I believe that's a good time frame. Uh, 67 to 80. Background and theme. Jude is concerned with apostasy. Even in his day, the church was already being infiltrated by religious quislings, men who posed as servants of God, but who were actually enemies of the cross of Christ. Jude's purpose is to expose these traitors and to describe their ultimate doom. An apostate is a person who professes to be a true believer, but who as a matter of fact, has never been regenerated. They are not true converts. They have not been born again. They do not trust. They have never believed in, put faith in, been firmly persuaded in the fact that Yeshua HaMashiach always existed. Jesus Messiah left glory, laid down his glory, was born of a virgin, wrapped in flesh, lived a perfect life, never sinned, and shed his precious blood to pay the debt for our sin once and for all, past, present, and future. He died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead, as 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 states, the gospel. So an apostate is a person who professes to be a true believer, but who, as a matter of fact, has never been regenerated. He may be baptized and participate fully in the privileges of a local Christian fellowship, but after a while, he willfully abandons the Christian faith and maliciously renounces the Savior. He denies the deity of Christ, his redemptive work at Calvary, his bodily resurrection, or other fundamental doctrines. And we are seeing it today with those who add works as a requirement. They are redefining the actual word of God, twisting it, and coming against the grace community. God have mercy on them. It is not at all a question of backsliding, which they try to say it is. The apostate was never converted at all. What are they backsliding from? They were never truly converted. He has no qualms about his... And by the way, when Chelsea did her video, great video, she talks about times that she, if you want to use the word backslide, but she was never lost. She was never unborn. She was never 
not a child of God because the nanosecond you believe his death, burial, and resurrection, his precious blood he shed, paying the debt for our sins, you are saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption. You are born again, regenerated, a work of Holy Spirit. You are a child of God, an heir of God, and a co-heir with Christ Jesus, and you are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. You can't be born again again. We will never be plucked from his hand. Eternal security references Ephesians 4.30 and Ephesians 1.13 and 14. So, for the apostate, they've never been born again. They are hardened in their unbelief and stubbornly opposed to the Christ of God. Apostasy is not simply a question of denying the Savior. Peter did that. Peter was a true believer. He believed on the Son of God and his death, burial, and resurrection, but he buckled under the pressure of a crisis. The seeds of apostasy were already sown in the early church. Paul warned the Ephesian elders that after his departure, savage wolves would come in, not sparing the flock, and that from among themselves men would rise up speaking for perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Acts 20, 29, and 30 is a reference. And we are seeing that today. They come on, they say they love God, they're believers, they come against the grace community, and oh, they twist scripture, they make it about themselves. Salvation is an event the nanosecond, hallelujah, never gets old. You believe you are safe, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption. They are wolves. They, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why we know that. Because they know they've been given the truth. Not only the truth about the gospel, but they say things that are false, bearing false witness against those who preach the gospel. And they know, they know they're lying. They know they're deceiving. And oh, God have mercy on them. God have mercy on them. In his first epistle, John spoke of those antichrist who had been in the Christian fellowship, but who manifested their un unreality by leaving it, that is, by abandoning their faith, 1 John 2, 18 and 19. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 to 4, we learn that there will be a great apostasy prior to the day of the Lord as we understand it. Now, I want to give you the order of events that are happening. First, the Lord will come into the air to take the church to the Father's house. That is John 14, 1 to 3, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. That, so that's the rapture. Then there will be a wholesale defection of those nominal Christians who are left behind. Then the man of sin will make his public debut on the world stage. Then the day of the Lord will begin, the seven-year tribulation period. The man of sin, the Antichrist, will be the arch arch apostate, not only opposing Christ, but demanding that he himself be worshipped as God. Peter gives a detailed por portrait of the apostate false teachers who will arise in the last days, 2 Peter 2.2. In some respects, his description closely parallels that which is given by, by Jude. So, I want to now begin reading Jude, and then we're going to break it down by verse or verses. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which kept not their first estate, 
but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of the core. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, Clouds, they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither with, withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So now we want to go, verse 1. God used a righteous Jude to unmask the apostates of whom another Jude, Judas Iscariot, was a prime example all that we know for certain about the good Jude is that he was a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. In addressing the letter, Jude gives three designations that are true of all believers. They are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. God has called these out of the world but the gospel, by the gospel to belong to himself. They are set apart by God to be God's special and pure people, and they are marvelously preserved from danger, damage, defilement, and damnation until, at last, they are ushered in to see the king of his in his beauty. Verse 2, Jude wishes for his readers mercy, peace, and love. The greeting is peculiar, is peculiar and suited to those who were facing the onslaught of those whose aim was to subvert the faith. Mercy means God's compassionate comfort and care for his beleaguered saints in times of conflict and stress. Peace is the serenity and confidence that come from reliance on God's word and from looking above circumstances 
to the one who overrules all circumstances for the accomplishment of his own purposes. Love is the undeserved embrace of God for his dear people, a super affection that should then be shared with others. He wishes that these three blessings be multiplied, not measured out by mere addition, but by multiplication. Verse 3, Jude had originally intended to write about the glorious salvation that is the common possession of all believers. But God's Spirit so influenced this yielded scribe that he seemed that he sensed a change of direction. A simple doctrinal essay would no longer do. It must be a fervent appeal that would strengthen the readers. They must be stirred up to contend earnestly for the faith. Attacks were being made on the sacred deposit of Christian truth, and efforts were already launched to whittle away the great fundamental doctrines. God's people must stand uncompromisingly for the inspiration, inerrancy, authority, and sufficiency of God's holy word. Yet in contending for the faith, the believer must speak and act as a Christian. As Paul wrote, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, be able to teach and patient, 2 Timothy 2.24. He must contend without being contentious and testify without, without ruining his testimony. Now that doesn't save them. That's for saved people. Hallelujah. We were born again the nanosecond we believed. What we contend earnestly for is the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Notice that. Not once upon a time, but once for all. The body of doctrine is complete. The canon is finished. Nothing more can be added. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. When some teacher claims to have a revelation which is above and beyond what is found in the Bible, we reject it out of hand. The faith has been delivered and we neither need nor heed anything else. This is our answer to the leaders of false cults with their books that claim equal authority with the scriptures. Verse 4, the nature of the threats of the threat is unveiled in verse 4. The Christian fellowship was being invaded by subversive elements. Certain men had wormed in unnoticed. It was an underground movement of stealth and deceit. These fifth columnists long ago were marked out for this condemnation. This seems to say that God selected these particular individuals to be doomed. But that is not the meaning the Bible never teaches that some are chosen to be damned. When men are saved, it is through the sovereign grace of God. But when they are finally lost, it is because of their own sin and disobedience. This expression teaches that the condemnation of apostates has been determined long beforehand. If men choose to fall away from the Christian faith, remember they were never true believers. They were never true converts then their condemnation is the same as that of the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness, the rebel angels, and the sodomites. They are not foreordained to fall away, but once they do apostatize by their own choice, they face the punishment predetermined for all apostates. Two prominent features of these ungodly persons are their depraved conduct and their corrupt doctrine. In their behavior, they turn the grace of God into lewdness. They twist Christian liberty into license and pervert freedom to serve into freedom to sin. In their doctrine, they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny his absolute right to rule, his deity, his vicarious death, his resurrection. In fact, they deny every essential doctrine of his person and work. While professing an expansive liberality in the spiritual realm, they are dogmatically and viciously opposed to the gospel, to the value of the precious blood of Christ, and to his being the only way of salvation. Now I want to pause there. And so these are not born-again believers. When it's talking about that, this is not about the believer who is struggling with sin. If you are born again, you are born again. I am born. I am saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption. If I struggled with drugs and went out and overdosed and died, that is a consequence. Temporally, 
sin still leads to death. Judicially, I am perfect in position to a holy God because of the precious blood of Jesus. And that sin debt was paid once and for all. Sin can no longer be attributed to my account. Who are these men? They are supposed ministers of the gospel. <clears throat> Boy, we have that even on YouTube. They are heretics. They are preaching a false gospel. They are supposed ministers of the gospel. They hold positions of leadership in Christendom. Some are bishops or church council members or seminary professors, but they all have this in common. They are against the Christ of the Bible and have invented for themselves a liberal or neo-Orthodox Christ stripped of glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Verse 5. There is no question about God's attitude toward these apostates. He has revealed it in the Old Testament on more than one occasion. Jude now wants to remind his readers of three such examples. The unbelieving Israelites, the angels that sinned, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. The first example is Israel in the wilderness, the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. See Numbers 13, 14, 1 Corinthians 10, 5 to 10. God had promised the land of Canaan to the people. In that promise was all the enablement they needed, but they accepted the evil report of the spies at Kadesh and rebelled against the Lord. As a result, all those men who were 20 or over when they left Egypt perished in the wilderness with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. You can see Hebrews 3, 16 to 19. The second example of rebellion and apostasy is the angels who sinned. All we know about them for certain is that they did not keep the domain that was assigned to them. They abandoned their own abode and they are now restrained in everlasting chains under darkness for their final judgment. Now, we do know that fallen angels made it with women. That's the Nephilim. I've done a video on that. You can Google Nephilim. It seems from scripture that there have been at least two apostasies of angels. One was when Lucifer fell and presumably involved a host of other angelic beings in his rebellion, these fallen angels are not bound at the present time. The devil and his demons are actively promoting war against the Lord and his people. The other apostasy of angels is the one referred to by Jude and also by Peter, 2 Peter 2.4. There is considerable difference of opinion among Bible students as to what event is referred to here. What we suggest is a personal viewpoint not a dogmatic assertion, and it's not a heaven or hell issue. We believe that Jude is referring to what is recorded in Genesis 6, 1 to 7. The sons of God left their proper estate as angelic beings, came down to the earth in human form, and married the daughters of men. The marital union was contrary to God's orders and an abomination to him. There may be a suggestion in verse 4 that these unnatural marriages produced offspring of tremendous strength and wickedness. These are the, Neph the Nephilim, the Raphaim, the giants of old. And again, I've done videos on that. When, whether or not you believe that or not, it does not have to be a, a fellowship breaker. It is clear that God was exceedingly displeased with the wickedness of man at this time and determined to destroy the earth with a flood. There are three objections to this viewpoint. One, the passage in Genesis does not mention angels, but only sons of God. Now, that's one viewpoint, but they're wrong because it talks about the Ben Elohim, the sons of God. So it really does. But when people, when it got translated, they don't believe that. Angels, people believe, are sex, sexless, sexless, and angels do not marry. It is true that angels are not specifically mentioned, but it is also true, well, they are, the, true that the term sons of God does refer to angels 
in Semitic languages. You can see Job 1, 6 and 2, 1. So in fact, in fact, it does. There is no biblical statement that angels are sexless. Angels sometimes appeared on earth in human form, having human parts and appetites. Genesis 18, 2, 22, compare 19, 1, 3 to 5. The Bible does not say that angels do not marry, but only that in heaven they neither marry nor give in marriage. That's Matthew twenty two thirty. So see, there are assumptions made. I firmly believe, brothers and sisters, that those fallen angels, now, in an apocryphal book, um, in Enoch, the apocryphal book of Enoch, we don't have it in our canon of scripture, there's accounts of this, as well as the rabbinic tradition, that those 200 angels, fallen angels, met at the base of Mount Hermon, and they made it. They took unto themselves wives of the daughter of men, and they had offspring, those giants. So they, they are basically hybrids. And I, I've done videos on how I believe they're going to change the DNA of people, the mark of the beast, just as in the days of Noah. Whatever historical incident may lie behind verse 6, the important point is that these angels abandoned the sphere which God had marked out for them and are now in chains and in darkness until the time when they will receive their final sentence to perdition. I believe they are the fallen angels that made it and that created those horrible offspring. Verse 7, the third Old Testament apostasy which Jude mentions is that of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Genesis 18, 16 to 9, Genesis 18, 16 to 19, and verse 29. The introductory word had, word as, shows that the sin of the Sodomites had featured, had features in common with that of the angels. It was gross immorality that was utterly against nature and abhorrent to God. The specific sin of perversion is discussed by Paul in Romans. Their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Romans 1, 26 and 27. The men of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Seboidom were greatly addicted to homosexuality. The sin is described here as having gone after strange flesh, meaning that it is completely contrary to the natural order which God has ordained. Is it mere coincidence that many modern day apostates are in the vanguard of those who publicly defend homosexuality and campaign for it to be legalized as long as it, as it is done between consenting adults. To all such libertines, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are exhibited as an example in suffering the punishment of eternal fire. That last expression, eternal fire, cannot mean that the fire which destroyed the wicked cities is eternal, but rather that in the thoroughness and vastness of its consuming power, it pictures the eternal punishment which will fall on all rebels. That is why it is urgent that if you have not admitted your sinner in need of a Savior and believed on the finished work of Christ, you do so today. Verse 8, Jude reverts to the subject of present-day apostates and launches into a description of their sins their indictment, their counterparts and nature, their doom, and their ungodly words and deeds. It's verses 8 to 16. First of all is the matter of their sins. By dreaming, they defile the flesh. Their thought life is polluted. Living in a world of filthy fantasies, they eventually find fulfillment of their dreams in sexual immorality, just like the men of Sodom. Sorry, I thought I heard something. They reject authority. They are rebels against God and against governmental institutions. Depend on them to be proponents of lawlessness and anarchy. Their names are on the membership roles of organizations that are dedicated to the overthrow of government. They speak evil of angelic dignitar uh, dignitaries. It means nothing to them that there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God, Romans 13, 1. They scorn the divine command, 
you shall not curse a ruler of your people, Exodus twenty two twenty eight. They speak contemptuously and spitefully against authority, whether it be divine, angelic, or human. Verse 9. In this respect, they take liberties, which even Michael the archangel would reject. When Michael disputed with the devil about the body of Moses, he did not dare rail against him, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. Here Jude shares with us an incident which is found nowhere else in the Bible. The question naturally arises, where did he get this information? Some say that the information was passed down by tradition. This may or may not be so. The most satisfying explanation is, is that the information was supernaturally revealed to Jude by the same Holy Spirit who moved him to write the epistle. We have no definite knowledge why the dispute arose between Michael and Satan about the body of Moses. We do know that Moses was buried by God in a valley of Moab. It is not unlikely that Satan wanted to know the spot so that he could have a shrine built there. Then Yisrael would turn to the idolatry idolatrous worship of Moses' bones. As the angelic representatives of the people of Israel, Daniel 10.21, Michael would strive to preserve the people from this form of idolatry by keeping the burial site secret. But the important point is this. Even if Michael is an archangel, the one whom God will use to cast Satan down from heaven, Revelations 12.7-9, still he did not presume to speak reproach, reproachfully to the one who rules in the realm of demons. He left all such rebuking to God. Verse 10. Headstrong and brazen, the apostates speak disrespectfully in areas of which they are ignorant. They do not realize that in any ordered society, there must be authority and there must be subjection to that authority. And so they surge forward and swagger around in arrogant rebellion. And we are seeing that with those false teachers today. They, they take no godly counsel, even when presented with the word. They distort the word, like John 3.16 and Romans 10.9-10, the word for believe is pishuo. It means to believe, have faith, be firmly persuaded. They are making a mockery of the word of God, and, and they know that, the, that even when presented with the truth, they, they alter the word of God and outright lie, not only about the word of God and the Lord and his precious blood, that he shed his death, burial, and resurrection being all sufficient for the remission of all our sins. They lie about those who bring the true gospel, and they know they're lying. They do, they're ravenous wolves. God have mercy on them. The area in which they are most knowledgeable is that of natural instincts the gratification of sensual appetites with the mindlessness of unreasoning animals. They abandon themselves to sexual gratification and in the process, they corrupt and destroy themselves. One of the things about these false teachers who rail against the grace of God and the true gospel is that they'll say, those who believe, who teach the grace, who believe that we're solo fide baby, we're saved by faith plus nothing, faith plus nothing equals salvation and eternal security. Again, I've done the video and the ABCs of salvation is in the description box. So they rail, they just rail. And um, it's, it's sad. It's so sad. I'm just listening for a second. I'm going to give you an example. So, because a dear sister did a great video, I wanted to see what the video before was. And as I was listening, the individual, I'm not naming names. I'm not saying that person's not saved. Maybe they were saved at one point and got caught up into this false doctrine. It's sad, but it can happen. So I'm not going to judge that. But as a person was doing the video, her cigarette smoke was, I guess, apparent because someone had apparently made a comment, what about the cigarette smoke? And she said, yeah, that's not a sin, that's bondage. Is bondage to God's standard of perfection? Listen, if you smoke, that won't keep you out of heaven. People have heard me say this often. If you have believed on the Son of God, 
I have 70,000 thoughts a day. Not every thought is to God's standard of moral perfection. And so that smoking is bad for you. Smoking will not keep you out of heaven. It may get you there sooner and you may smell like you came from hell. But for someone who's railing against those who instead of focusing on sin, focus on their identity in Christ. Focusing on sin never kept anyone from sinning. And trying to do it in yourself and make that a requirement to your salvation, you're, if you've never believed and trusted in the finished work of Christ alone, solo fide, for the remission of all your sins, his death, burial, and resurrection, then you've never been born again. And, and they're, oh, it's sad, it's sad. But I heard this person justify, and it's like, wow. Anyway, verse 11, a stinging indictment is pronounced upon them. Woe to them. Because of their stubborn and unrepentant heart, they store up with wrath for themselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, Romans 2.5. An unrepentant heart is they have not admitted their sinners in need of a Savior, metanoia, changed their mind, and trusted in the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Their career is described as a plummeting fall of ever-increasing velocity. First, they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the era of Balaam. Finally, they perished in the rebellion of Korah. Error and apostasy are never static. They lead people pell-mell to the precipice, then over it to destruction. The way of Cain is basically the rejection of salvation through the blood of a sacrificial victim. Genesis 4 tells us that. I'm going to say that again. The way of Cain. It's basically the rejection of salvation through the blood of a sacrificial system. It is the attempt to appease God by human efforts. Uh, one theologian, McIntosh, says, God's remedy to cleanse is rejected, and man's effort to improve is put in its place. This is the way of Cain. But of course, reliance on human effort leads to, to a hatred of grace. Did you hear that? Reliance on human effort leads to a hatred of grace and to the objects of grace. And that hatred eventually leads to persecution and even murder, 1 John 3.15. The era of Balaam is the desire of to become personally wealthy by making a business out of the service of God. Balaam professed to be a prophet of God, but he was covetous and willing to prostitute his prophetic gift for money. That's Numbers 22 to 24. Five times Balak paid him to curse Israel, and he was more than willing to do it, but he was forcibly restrained by God. Many of the things that he said were true and beautiful, but for all that, he was a hireling prophet. He couldn't curse the men of Israel, but he eventually succeeded in luring them into sin with the daughters of Moab. That's Numbers 25, 1 to 5. Like Balaam, the false teachers of today are suave and convincing. They can speak out of both corners of their mouths at once. They suppress the truth in order to increase their incomes. The principal point is that they are greedy, seeking to make the house of God a house of merchandise. Christendom today is leavened by the sin of simony. If the profit motive could somehow be removed, much of what passes as Christian work would come to a retching, a screeching halt. One scholar, Coates, said, Man is so base that he makes gain for himself out of God's things. The ultimate point of man's baseness is that he will make gain out of God's things for himself. The Lord has a definite judgment on it all. We can see how Christendom is full of it, and we have to watch watch it in ourselves, lest that element come in. I'm not talking about supporting ministries. My wife and I do that. And I'm not talking about giving the worker who's worthy of their due. We're talking about this base and vile. Remember the motives, the motives. The third reason for the woe pronounced by Jude 
is that these false teachers have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Along with Dathan and Abiram, Korah rebelled against the leadership of Moses and Aaron and desired to intrude into the priestly office, number 16. And this they were actually spurning the Lord. For their insubordination, they were swallowed alive in a great earthquake. God thus showed his extreme displeasure at rebellion against those whom he has set up as his representatives. Verse 12. Next, Jude chooses five similes from the world of nature to picture the character and destiny of the apostates. Moffat says that the sky, land, and sea are ransacked for illustrations of the character of these men. They are spots in the love feast which we were held, which were held by the early Christians in connection with the Lord's Supper. They fear neither God nor man and care for themselves rather than for the flock. They lure others to be smirch the faith. They are clouds without water, appearing to hold promise of refreshment to the parched countryside, but then carried along by the winds and leaving disappointment and disillusionment. They are late autumn trees, stripped of leaves and fruit, twice dead, may be an intensive form meaning thoroughly dead. Or it may mean dead in the root as well as the branches. Also, they are pulled up by the roots as if torn out of the ground by a strong wind and leaving no stump as a possible future source of life and growth. 13. They are raging waves of the sea, ungovernable, boisterous, and furious. For all their noise and motion, there is nothing to show but the foam of their shame. They glory in what they should be ashamed of and leave nothing of substance and value behind. Finally, they are like wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wandering stars are celestial bodies that do not move in regular orbit. They are worthless as navigational aids. How appropriate a description of the false teachers. It is impossible to get spiritual direction from these religious meteors, falling stars, and comets who blaze brightly for a moment, then fizzle out into darkness like firework rockets. 14. The doom of the apostates was foretold by Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam. It is a prophecy that is found only in Jude's epistle. Some think it is taken from the apocryphal book of Enoch, but there is no proof that the spurious book exists in the time of Jude. A theologian said, It, Enoch, has every mark of having been written subsequent to the destruction of Jerusalem, and therefore after Jude's epistle was written by a Jew who still buoyed himself up with the hope that God would stand by the Jews. While we do not know how Jude learned of this ancient prophecy, a simple and plausible explanation is that the Holy Spirit revealed the words to him just as he guided in all the rest of the epistle. The prophecy begins, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. The prediction will have a preliminary and partial fulfillment when the Lord Jesus returns to earth after the tribulation to destroy his foes and to reign as king. It will have its complete and final fulfillment at the end of the millennium when the wicked dead are judged in the great white throne. Verse 15, Christ comes to execute judgment on all. The rest of the verse shows that the all here means all the ungodly. True believers will not be included. Through faith in Christ, they have been granted immunity from judgment as promised in John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. Hallelujah. As the Son of Man to whom all judgment has been committed, the Lord Jesus will convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
Four times in this verse, we find the word ungodly occurring. The people are ungodly. Their deeds are ungodly. The manner in which they perform these deeds is ungodly. And they further manifest their ungodliness by their blasphemies against the Lord. He will convict them of the whole ungodly business, not just in the sense of making them feel a deep sense of guilt, but convicting them by pronouncing sentence as a result of their proven guilt. Verse 16. Their ungodly words and deeds are now described in more detail. They are grumblers complaining against the the providences of God instead of being thankful for his mercies. The fact that God hates such griping is abundantly proved by his punishment of Israel in the wilderness. They are always finding fault with the Lord. Why does he permit wars and sufferings? Why doesn't he put an end to all the social injustice? If he is all-powerful, why doesn't he do something about the mess the world is in? They also find fault with God's people for being narrow-minded in creed and puritanical in conduct. They live lustfully, indulging the passions of the flesh and being the loudest in advocating permissiveness in the sexual realm. Their arrogant speech proves a real attention-getter by their shocking espousal of political, economic, and social extremism, they make the headlines, and their bold, shameless repudiation of basic Christian doctrine, such as their assertion that God is dead, give them a certain notoriety among liberal theologians. Finally, they are masters in the art of flattery, thereby gaining a following for themselves and a comfort income as well. This portrait is true and accurate. It is confirmed almost every day by the news media of the world. Verse 17, Jude now turns away from the apostates to the believer's role in the midst of these hiring shepherds. First, he reminds them that they have been forewarned as to the oncoming peril. Then he encourages them to maintain themselves in a strong spiritual condition. Finally, he counsels them to use discernment in ministering to those who had been victimized by the apostates. The apostles had predicted the rise of false teachers. This can be seen in the ministries of Paul, Acts 20, 29 and 30, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9, Peter, 2 Peter 2, 1 to 22, and 3, 1 to 4, and John, 1 John 2, 18 and 19, verses 18 and 19. The gist of their message was that in the last time, mockers would appear following their own ungodly lust. To this testimony, Jude now, Jude now adds explanation that these scoffers have three prominent characteristics. They are sensual persons, which means that they think and act as natural men. They cause divisions, drawing disciples after themselves, and perhaps dividing people into various classes according to their progress in apostasy. Excuse me a second. They do not have the spirit. They were never um, they were never born from above. And therefore have a total incapacity to understand the things of God. They're not Christians. Verse 20. The believer's resource, of course, is to stay close to the Lord and live in unbroken fellowship with him. But how is this done? Jude gives four steps. The first is building yourself up on your most holy faith. That is the Christian faith. We build up ourselves on it by studying and obeying the Bible. Constant familiarity with the word guides us positively in the way of righteousness and warns us against the perils along the way. Men may decry doctrine, H. Pickering says, but it is creed that produces character and not character that produces creed. The second step is praying 
in the Holy Spirit. This means to pray as guided by the Spirit in accordance with the will of God as revealed in the Bible or as privately revealed by the Spirit in a subjective way to the believer. It is in contrast to prayers which are recited mechanically or spun off without any real spiritual involvement. Verse 21, then again, believers are to keep themselves in the love of God. Here, the love of God can be compared to the sunshine. The sun is always shining, but when something comes between us and the sun, we are no longer in the sunshine. That's the way it is with the love of God. It is always beaming down upon us, but if sin comes between us and the Lord, we don't lose our salvation. It can impact our fellowship. There's a vast difference between our salvation and our spiritual growth. It is always beaming down the love of God upon us. But if sin comes between us and the Lord, then we are no longer enjoying his love in practice. We can keep ourselves in his love, first of all, by lives of being renewed in our mind and being washed in the purity of the truth of God's word. And if sin should come between, then we should confess that sin First John, that's for the believer, not to maintain salvation, but about fellowship. If it comes between, there are so many times, there are sins of thought, sins of omission and sins of commission. But we know that there are things that we do that you feel convicted. Holy Spirit does that. And so you confess it. You're already saved. You don't lose your salvation. It's not a maintenance thing. You're doing it, it has nothing to do with your salvation, but your fellowship. I don't want anything to come between. I confess often. Um, finally, we should be eagerly looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The mercy of our Lord here refers to his imminent return to take his people home to heaven. In days of darkness and apostasy, we are to keep the light of the blessed hope burning in our hearts. It will prove a comforting and purifying hope. First Thessalonians 4.18, 1 John 3, 3, 3. Verse 22. A certain measure of spiritual discernment is necessary in dealing with victims of apostasy. The scriptures make a distinction between the way we should handle those who are active propagandists of false cults and those who have been duped by them. In the case of the leaders and propagandists, the policy is given in 2 John 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. But in speaking of those who have been deceived by false teacher, Jude counsels making a distinction and gives two separate courses of action. On some, we should have compassion. That is, we should show a compassionate interest in them and try to guide them out of doubts and disputations into a firm conviction of divine truth. Verse 23 then there are those who are on the verge of the precipice, ready to fall over into the flames of apostasy. These we are to save by strong, resolute warning and instruction, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. In the Old Testament, the clothing of a leper was contaminated and had to be burned. Leviticus 13, 47 and 52. Today, in dealing with people who have fallen into sexual sins, we must remember that material objects, such as clothing, for example, often excite the passions. As we see these things or feel them, there is a mental association with certain sins. So in dealing with people who have become defiled, we must be careful to avoid anything which, must, which might prove a temptation in our own lives. An unknown author expressed it like this. The clothes that belong to a man have to a man have about them the association and infection of sin, the contagion of evil. Whatever is associated with a life of sin should be cast off and renounced. If we are to be safe from the infection and contagion of this soul-destroying disease. Now remember, that's not about being born again. If you're born again, you're born again. If I, if I being a married man, and I never have. But if I decided, if I yielded to sin, if that was my iniquity, my bent towards sin, and I, 
became a sex addict and a drug addict. I could literally die from that very thing. But I'm still born again if I have truly believed, placed my faith and trust in the Son of God and his redemptive work on the cross of Calvary. Verse 24, Jude closes with a beautiful benediction. It is the ascription of praise and worship to him who is able. He is able to save, Hebrews 7.25, able to establish Romans 16.25, able to aid, Hebrews 2.18, able to subdue, Philippians 3.21, and here he is able to keep. He is able to keep us in perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3. He is able to keep that which we have committed to him until that day, 2 Timothy 1, 12. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, Ephesians 3, 20. And he is able to keep us from stumbling. This latter promise is especially timely for the days of apostasy to which Jude is referring. But the promise doesn't stop there. He is able to make us stand faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. This is truly stupendous. When we think of what we are, dead through our trespasses and sins, when we think of what we are, poor, weak, failing servants, and then to think that one day we will stand absolutely faultless in the throne room of the universe, rejoicing with exceeding joy. What grace is this? Verse 25. He is not only our keeper and perfecter, he is God our Savior. It is a marvel that God should be so interested in us that he would also become our Savior in the sense that he devised the plan whereby we are saved and he provided his sinless son as the sacrificial lamb who alone is wise. Ultimately, all wisdom comes from God. That's James 1.5. Our wisdom is merely derived from the fount of wisdom, the only wise God. If worship, Old English, worth-ship, means ascribing to God what he is worthy of, it will be glory and majesty, dominion and power. Glory, super honor he deserves for all he is and all he has done for us. Majesty, the dignity and splendor he deserves as the supreme monarch of the universe. Dominion, the unchallenged sway, which is his by sovereign right and power or authority, the might and prerogative to rule all that his hands have made. He was worthy of such praise in the past. He is worthy at the present time and he will be worthy of it throughout eternity. Apostates and false teachers may seek to rob him of glory, detract from his majesty, grumble against his dominion, and challenge his power. But all true believers find their greatest fulfillment in glorifying and enjoying him both now and forevermore. Amen. I hope you have been blessed by the study of Jude, a short epistle, but packed and so relevant to today. God bless you guys. Shalom, shalom, and have an awesome rest of your day.